Hey everyone, it's Anthony Cazenza and it's that time of the week again for the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. We are so happy to have you with us. I'm Anthony Cazenza and I'm joined by my usual co-host in person this week, John Sheeran, who joined us via mobile last week. He's looking like, uh, for those who aren't watching the video, you, you look like Harrison Ford in uh, Blade Runner. Did you ever see the movie Blade Runner, the old one? I, I've never seen the old one. With the with the coat, you got a little bit of the scruff going. You got the the green gray big coat. Looks like looks like Blade Runner. I'm going. I'm back. wearing the coat because it feels like negative ten outside. I know you're living in Southern California. You don't, you're not dealing with the polar vortex like ninety nine percent of the other rest of the country. <laughs> but it's cold out there. I had to start my car twice out there, and I thought I was going to die of frostbite. I, I've heard it's uh, it's pretty chilly out there. I probably shouldn't tell you what it is in, in Southern California, uh, right? What it's been in Southern California recently. But good to have you back, sir. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. But uh, good time down at the Senior Bowl. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I, I took Joe Goodberry's Uber virginity, and we had oh. some. Uh, I basically dragged him out of bed to go to the bars, and we had we had some fun outside of the practices. That was a good time. Good. So Uber virginity is he, that uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, fact that he's? Does that mean he has never taken an Uber or Lyft service before, uh, ride service before? Apparently, the the st the state of New York and the city of New York are actually more have more in common than I originally thought because I guess there hasn't been Ubers in just anywhere in New York because they have the loyalty to cabs. So he just never took one ever because he always took cabs. So, so I got him in an Uber, and he was like extremely uncomfortable the entire time. Like Joe, just just, just relax. Sorry, right? it's just, it's basically a taxi, but you just know where it is at all times. So. Oh, Joe, we got we got to get him. Uh, we got to get him back on the show, and uh, I, that's if when we do, we'll definitely have to give him some grief on that. That's funny, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll talk we'll talk to you a little bit more just in, in just a little bit about the Senior Bowl impressions, players who impressed. And maybe a couple other fun stories from you if uh, if we have the chance. I'm glad you were able to do that, and uh, very grateful that you joined us from there uh, last week. I, it sounds like it was a, a lot of fun. You guys met some good people, so that's pretty awesome. Speaking of of some news, just some quick announcements that I think uh, is is pretty cool for this show and um, shows a lot of growth of this program. Number first of all, you, we, when you hear us talk about you know how you can get the programs, you know I, I say it a handful of times, probably every episode where we you know iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play and all that. One of the platforms was Art Nineteen. Um, when we were adopted by the SB Nation family of podcasts, Art Nineteen was their preferred platform to go through in terms of disseminating the podcast through those other apps and channels and whatnot. Well. Um, SB Nation, since they've grown that uh, their family of podcasts, and those podcasts have grown exponentially, more on that in a second, um, they have now switched platforms from Art19 to something called Megaphone. Um, so it's just a, a more user-friendly and a, a better network or a better platform to use for, for listeners. That doesn't really change too much except for the fact that if you were getting the program through directly through the art 19 website then you'll now be getting it through megaphone otherwise if you're subscribed to our feeds if you're subscribed to itunes stitcher google play any of that stuff nothing will change there nothing will change through the youtube channel either um and if you're getting the show on cincyjungle.com you'll see the audio that's kind of embedded in the post that's the art 19 instead it's going to be embedded by megaphone so really not a lot of changes but just want to make you aware when you hear megaphone instead of art 19 that's what we're talking about there is a change there another quick announcement uh a few weeks ago we we had the privilege of interviewing tyler boyd talking about a number of different subjects unfortunately we had scheduled mark walton for an interview that didn't come to fruition unfortunately but uh we've been approached to be able to to talk to tyler boyd again about a month later and we're going to talk to him about some other different stuff uh some different topics now that you know, the Bengals are closer to naming their new head coach. I think we all know who at this point who that will be and where the Bengals are going to be headed. So we are actually catching up with Tyler Boyd again later this week. And a second interview with him will be available through the podcast network. Let's, let's hope that 
what happened with Mr. Walton doesn't happen with Mr. Boyd this time, but uh, there should be a second interview with Tyler Boyd coming up on the feed uh, in the next handful of days. So we're excited to be talking to him again, and it will be a different interview, I promise, than uh, the first one we had a few weeks ago. So we're excited to have Tyler Boyd on the program again here on the Orange and Black Insider. And finally, I was. Uh, this is why we kind of got a little bit of a late start. Uh, among other reasons tonight, uh, I was reviewing some of the podcast download numbers and all of that with my co-host, John Sheeran, and I'm pleased to announce that we have absolutely shattered some of our highest download numbers of this show uh, this month. This month has been outstanding. Now, um, so, some of that has to do with the SB Nation adoption that that took place at the beginning of the season and the additional promotion that comes from that. Some of that has to do with the fact that there's just more news and, uh, you know, the, the the interest level of Bengals fans has risen. So, uh, w- you know, there's just more listeners and more to talk about than usual this offseason with the coaching and all that stuff. Um, we've tried to give you a couple of other things to download, the Tyler Boyd interviews and breaking news stuff, all that stuff. But it still has to be given the kudos have to be given to the listeners john uh, because they are showing great uh enthusiasm a, a renewed vigor in this team i guess and uh we are reaping the benefits of that so i want to say thank you i'm sure john you echo my sentiments on that yeah i mean i guess we couldn't entirely convince people to switch from locked on Bengals to us but since locked on Bengals, <laughs> now, i guess it didn't really have a choice so how, no matter how you got here i'm glad you're here and i'm glad that you're downloading the crap out of our show because it just makes it better so thanks guys yeah it's uh i mean it, it is a substantial increase um by by thousands and thousands um to be quite honest with you which is awesome um for our our podcast our little niche in the podcast world we talk about not the most popular team, but we love doing it. And uh, the, some of the most passionate fans are our Bengals fans, and uh, they come on this show. So thank you for the, for downloading. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your emails, your engagement during our live shows, whether that's call, chat, the YouTube chat, all that stuff. Can't thank you enough. We appreciate it. So just a couple of house cleaning items before we kind of kick off into everything this week. I wanted to just say thank you and let you know about some things coming down the pike. Now I can say you can download this show on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play, on Megaphone. I got to get used to saying that on Megaphone. Also on YouTube. And of course, all of our stuff is on CincyJungle.com. So keep downloading how you've been downloading it. We appreciate the support and uh, we can't thank you enough for that. Yeah, so I guess the ma- main topic has just been the Senior Bowl re- recap and just the aftermath of that. Um, overall, I think, and if you weren't here uh, last week when I kind of ran down the Senior Bowl stuff, I think the the main positions that stuck out with them was just the overall trench players, offensive and defensive linemen. It's me- really like one of the main reasons why I like to go down there and see those one-on-one matchups. But other like besides that, you know, watching receivers and cornerbacks, you know, and their one-on-ones really tells you a lot about them as well. And I think the positions that really stu- stood out were just the offensive linemen, defensive linemen, wide receivers. I think that just looking at the upperclassmen in this draft class, I think there's a lot of guys worthy in that day two to day three range. Not really top heavy, except for maybe the def- defensive tackle um, position group that has a lot of those guys who are going to go top 16. But I think for what the Bengals need, which they probably need some receiver depth. They definitely need some key contributors on both the offensive and defensive line. I think this was a great senior bowl for them to really invest in. Unfortunately, they didn't have a lot of their coaching staff down there because they just don't have a big coaching staff at the moment. But mm-hmm. in, in general, I think there was a lot of defensive tackles that stood out. The, a couple of Texas A&M players and Dalen Mack and Kingsley Kiki, uh, some some penetrating three techniques. There was a guy from Arizona State, um, last name was Ren, like Keelan Ren, I think was his name. Kalen Saunders, the guy you may have seen backflipping because his, his, mm-hmm. his, uh, his daughter was born while he was down the senior bowl. He had a great week as well. There's a couple edge rushers in Montez Sweat and Jalen Ferguson who are probably going to go either late first round or maybe in that day two range. They really popped up, pop, pop, stood out as well. And mainly for the offensive linemen, the North offensive line 
was prob was really the the steel show. They had like the, ma the majority of talented offensive linemen down there, starting with the center Garrett Bradbury of North Carolina State. He's like a true zone blocking center that really would be the staple of the type of offense that the Bengals would probably want to run, which includes a lot of outside zone and wide zone. I don't know where Billy Price is going to be in this new coach staff where they want him, but I do think that it would benefit the Bengals to have a true zone blocking center. And he probably fits that the best out of any center in this class. So it was good to see him up close. There's a, a handful of guards that really showed out the two guards from Oklahoma. Um, th th yeah, there was two guards from Oklahoma, two guards from Wisconsin, the Oklahoma guards, Probably stole the show more than the Wisconsin guards and probably displayed better grip strength, better anchoring ability. But there's two guards in Chris Lindstrom and Nate Davis. Lindstrom is a Boston College guy. And he's a great second-level blocker. And Davis kind of reminds me of Shaq Mason. And if you know Shaq Mason, he's the Patriots guard. He's like 6'1", 315 pounds. Davis is like 6'3", 306, but he plays with his butt like in the dirt, basically. And no one can out-leverage him. He's got thighs as you know, thick as tree limbs. So... A lot of great talent in the trenches. And from the wide receivers, I know some of our listeners are going to know this name, Terry McLaurin, the wide receiver from Ohio State. I think he had like 11 mm -hmm. touchdowns last year. But basically, he's probably what's, what he is probably what the Bengals coaches haven't thought Cody Core was going to be, just a dominant special teams player who can just cannot be touched on punt teams and against gunners and whatever. He, he'll be an immediate contributor for an NFL team. I think he would provide value for the Bengals because – when you're looking at what the Bengals offense could be, it's probably going to rely more on a lot of heavy receiver sets and maybe not so much as tight ends. And, you know, just looking at what they did, what they did this year and how little they got out of Alex Erickson, Auden Tate, Josh Malone, Cody core. I think that they're, they should be interested in acquiring some receiver depth in case another AJ green injury happens in case Tyler Boyd may take a step back or in case John Ross doesn't take that next step. They're going to rely on, heavily on receivers under an offense that will probably emulate a lot from the Rams. And I think there's a number of receivers in this draft class that can provide them of that depth and maybe push some of those other guys. And besides McLaurin, there was uh, Ke Keelan Doss. Uh, he was a small school guy. I think UC Davis, he showed great uh, natural leaping ability in hands. And there was a couple other uh, small school receivers. I think Travis Fulgram from Old Dominion, I want to say. He looked really natural in red zone drills. And uh, obviously Debo Samuel was like, the consensus senior bowl MVP, this receiver from South Carolina showed tremendous ability to release at the line of scrimmage. So receivers, offensive and defensive line, there's going to be great depth. And I think that was like the main takeaway for me from the senior bowl practices and where the talent is beyond the first round of this draft class. So we talked about it a little, uh, I talked about it a little bit last week, I think John, and you had, um, I think, you know, you had gotten off the line at this point, but, if you look at what the Rams do on offense and the success Jared Goff has had, now granted they have one of, if not the best back in the league in Todd Gurley. Um, the Bengals have one of the top ones in the league, at least by last year's standards in Joe Mixon. It, it would seem that Cincinnati would want to employ – with Zach Taylor coming in a little bit of the play action scheme where they, they spread a lot of guys out, probably three, four, five guys. They, you know, fake the handoff and then they're able to kind of play pitch and catch in a lot of different areas of the field. I went through and I examined what the Ram the Rams basically had seven players of 25 or more receptions with only one of them being a running back. The Bengals had five with two of them being running backs. Um, the Rams had two 1,200-yard receivers in Brandon Cooks and Robert, uh, Robert Woods. The Bengals didn't have any. Um, so, granted, there's injuries. A.J. Green was out. Dalton was out. But the, the scheme still rings true. And I think that's where the Senior Bowl, for me, was a little intriguing because I think everybody had their eyes, up, for the Bengals' standpoint at least, on the offensive line, at linebacker, maybe edge rusher. But I think this team, if especially if you look at these two teams playing in the Super Bowl this Sunday – they use a lot of guys in a lot of different ways. I mean, the Patriots don't have as many perimeter weapons, but they use a lot of slot guys. They use a lot of different things, a lot of different weapons in a lot of different ways. I think that's where the Bengals might start under Zach Taylor. They may look at some of these guys to bring in and bolster that receiving group, and it could have a very different look at the bottom end of it, uh, of the depth chart, I think. And the kid also, I think I think you maybe mentioned him, the kid from Georgia State. Um, Penny Hart. Yeah. He's a guy I forgot. Yeah, guy, guys like that, 
I, I think could come into the Bengals, be added maybe day two, day three picks, but can bring more to the table than a Cody core. Um, we don't know much about out and Tate at this point. Um, you know, Josh Malone was a guy I was high on, whatever. But do you see them and some of these guys in the senior bowl potentially filling that role as the Bengals maybe try and do a little bit of what the Rams have done lately? Well, yeah, I think the biggest issue, you know, going into the last couple of seasons for the Bengals is when they lost a lot of guys for agency. They still had decent starters at the at the top, you know, the guys who would play a lot of snaps, but if there would be injuries that occur, in which they always do when you when you talk about the Bengals, they don't have the the depth to really re- compensate for those losses, and that's always been kind of their biggest issue. Is that you know on, on paper some of these guys in, in the back half of the roster they, they may seem alright, but when you when they're given significant snaps, for some reason they just never seem to fully develop into the players that we think they were. And maybe that's coaching, maybe that's just bad evaluations. But now when you have a chance under a completely new coaching staff, either A, you finally get the most out of those Josh Malones, those Alex Erickson's, those Auden Tates, or you find brand new eyes to bring in quality guys that can potentially fill in those the fourth, fifth, and sixth receiver spots. And like you said, that's going to be huge for an offense that will try to emulate what the Rams do because the Rams ran 11 personnel, which is three receivers on the field, I think 95% of the time. And they mm-hmm. ran it off a lot of bunch sets, so uh, a lot of condensed formations. So you give the receivers a lot of options to run in-breaking or out-breaking routes and really manipulate the, the cornerbacks into playing outside or inside leverage and really dictates what you can do as an offense when you run a lot of out of the same look. You know, you can do a lot of different things, but look at look at the same, so you're not really tipping your hand to the defense. But you have to have guys who have the ability to do, to do a lot of different things. And maybe the Bengals need to worry about just finding good players instead of just finding guys who are maybe specialized in one or two things. And I think that's going to be very important for Zach Taylor and his staff and Duke Tobin even to make an evolution on his, on his process as an evaluator because now you're looking at guys who could fit a whole different criteria than what the last, you know, 16 years of, of Bengals football has filled and I think the senior bowl showed a lot of guys that had the potential to do that. So last year there was a young man who came from a somewhat small school and he had kind of a high draft stock second round maybe third round going into the weekend and by the time it was all said and done um, he was the talk of the senior bowl he he was basically one of the best offensive linemen in the in the group just because more eyes got on him and that was will hernandez um Mm -hmm. that was one of the guys so was there somebody that maybe fits a similar mold whether it's on the offensive line or what have you that you know came in as maybe a mid-round uh mid-round guy uh maybe second round guy and all of a sudden it, it was like wow this guy, we, we got to go back and look m- more at this guy, maybe because he was at a small school, maybe because he plays a position that just kind of gets overlooked, or I don't know. Two players on name. I think I mentioned Montez Sweat, and I think that yeah. it's the best for him because that first day, those one-on-one drills, and, and like they're obviously favored for the defensive lineman because you're going in a one-on-one situation where you're not giving the tackle any help, and you, know, you already know what's going to happen. He was just bulldozing guys. And honestly, just, just watching him, you know, work on you know uh, transferring from a bull rush to a rip move on the outside and just his moving his just 35 inch arms i think at 65 260 it reminded me a lot of dunlap and a lot and just a lot of the way he just fluidly transitions from inside to outside counters but he's got you know strong hands he obviously has a lot of lower body power to, to you know knock guys you know 300 pounds back on their back on their butts which he did a bunch in the first two days i think he had a great week i think he was originally entering this week a second you know day two kind of guy but now he's getting talked in the first round so senior bowl practices definitely helped him out and as far as a guy who kind of has that similar you know build up to an to a will hernandez or an isaiah win who also had a great senior bowl last year chuma idoga the, the offensive tackle from usc so you, you may know a thing or two about him he's only like six four three oh three but i think he measured in with 35 inch arms which for a guy with with that measurements that's pretty insane length but Unlike Cedric Boy, he, he knows how to use that length. You know, he, he times his punches really well, and his feet and his hands are always in sync. So he always is able to to measure or, or mirror either speed rushes or power rushes. He plays with good pad level, which naturally comes with being 6'4". But he had a really good week, and he surprised me because when I watched him on tape going into that week, I didn't think really much of him. I thought that he had decent athleticism, but his hands 
weren't as consistent as he showed in the senior bowl. So now he's going to, I don't know where you draft him at this point because I'm not really sure where his stock was before. And now it could be anywhere between, you know, early day three or maybe even sneaking up to the, the beginning or the middle of the second round. So I think he's got a lot of work to do up still and still has to test well. But um, I think he was one of the, the five best players who practiced at the senior bowl. That was really surprising for me because I didn't think much of him going into. And I, and I do think that now he has potentially a feature at offensive tackle, which I didn't think of much before. Yeah. I mean, I, I just know paying a little more attention to USC than other teams. Uh, personally, I, I know that usually USC has a dominant offensive line. They pride themselves on getting these big guys up front and uh, especially guys that can help out in the run game. And last year, USC's run offense was not good. And, uh, you know, I think he was part of that issue, but there were other issues. They also lost Ronald Jones, who was an amazing running back for them. Right. Um, so it was kind of a, a perfect storm of issues, but uh, good to hear that, you know, that, that could be a guy that's on the, on the radar and day, you know, third round, fourth round, something like that. Uh, maybe even second round, like you said, depending on how teams value him and, and the scheme that he fits in. Talking Senior Bowl with uh, John Sheeran, he he joined us last week from there. Uh, John, the other, the other person I kind of want to ask you about um, is Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones is a quarterback. We, we talked last week about how, you know, Drew, Drew Locke, I believe it was, the Missouri quarterback was, you know, enigmatic and he was charismatic on the stage and Daniel Jones is very just monotonous and boring. And, um, but when it came time for on the field play, Daniel Jones actually played pretty well and won the, won the MVP. I watched some of the clips, you know, I, I wasn't absolutely blown away by what I saw, but he had some nice throws. He threw a touchdown, ran for a touchdown, big kid, big arm. Um, what's your take on him? after seeing him this week and, and seeing what you saw in the actual bowl game, because we know these games can be difficult to really gauge because they have such limited time to work with their receivers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta come clean. You know, I watched all those practices and I watched maybe 10 minutes of the actual game. But yeah. I don't, I don't really care about it that much because there's not a lot of things that you can really take away from it because you know, the schemes are pretty bland and whatever, but j j just from practices, j Jones did, really nothing to really separate himself from the pack like obviously Locke has like the natural arm and the release that teams look for and he's got the velocity and you know natural arm strength and I think Jones is in an offense where Drew Locke would probably fit better because Jones's offense at Duke was predicated on a lot of four verts four verticals and just down through downfield throws in general so he always had the tendency to keep looking downfield and not really look down to his check down and he was always had the willingness to keep the big play alive, but he didn't have the athleticism to kind of create for himself and extend plays, get out of the pocket. And, and sometimes he would take unnecessary hits and maybe even take a sack or two, but he would always be trying to look downfield, but he's going to be a guy that I think, you know, people look at his size and he's like six, four, six, five, you know, 220, 230, kind of like the build of a Carson Palmer, but he just doesn't have the arm that you would expect someone built that way to have. I'm not saying he has a weak arm, but it, it's definitely not, as strong as maybe the perception would, would seem it to be a lot of balls downfield kind of float on him. doesn't have the, exactly the velocity that you're looking for. And, you know, the placements would be there if he had a little more torque and a little bit, maybe of a faster release, but that kind of comes with the territory if you're as big as Jones as well. So in, in practices, he didn't really stand out at all. I think, I think he's a better in, in the pocket passer than a guy like Jones is who gets really skittish with his feet and I think, you know, when, when Jones is able to kind of stay on his on his launch point and, and release where he wants to, I think the ball comes out pretty cleanly. But I, I, I value college production extremely high for quarterbacks, and he didn't really produce that well at Duke. And maybe that's a product of, you know, who he, who he was playing with. But even still, like, I don't think that much of him, and I don't think he did anything to really wow me at the senior bowl practices to kind of sway that opinion. Okay. Well, we'll talk about a little bit more about him uh, with a listener question we already have queued up towards the end of the program. And by the way, we're getting questions if we are taking listener questions. We're going to try to do that. You can uh, call or text 949-542-6241. Calls will be taken towards the end of the show, but you can always send in a, pro, uh, a text uh, throughout the program, and we'll, we'll try and monitor that. Um, just finishing up some Senior Bowl talk, John, any other fun stories, random stories? Uh, 
interesting, interesting folks you met. Anything else that uh, you want to share with us about about the Senior Bowl for those of us who were unfortunate, the unfortunate ones who were not able to go? Mobile is a fun town, and it's perfect for the Senior Bowl because it's like big enough. Like there's like maybe two or three skyscrapers. It looks kind of like a decent city, but there's not a ton to do. But there's kind of just enough for a group of football nerds to kind of hang out. And there was this one bar that I guess is like the niche bar to go to. And it's like called Veets, which is like the most dive bar you could possibly think of. But I met a lot of people that, you know, I followed on Twitter for years and kind of met them for the first time face to face. And that was just a really cool experience. Like just speaking generally that and genuinely from the heart, that was just a really cool experience to kind of interact with those guys that, you know, you've been talking online for a long time, but just haven't really met and haven't really seen their face. And you just kind of realize, you know, when you just sit down and like, converse with them for like 15 20 minutes you come to the simple realization that we are all freaking nerds man like we, <laughs> i just got way too much time talking about football but just, just 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 interacting with these guys and you know just like hanging out with them talking about real life stuff and it, it was just it was just fun as hell and that's why i would always want to come down for the senior role because you know it, 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 it's a great community that football twitter is and has and i know it gets really toxic at times but you know just I don't want to get corny or anything, but it's, it's just a fun time. And, and you know, it, it was just a fun time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's really neat that you got to interact with some of those people. And I know that some of those people also, you know, we all follow them on Twitter and, and uh, it's, it's pretty neat that you were able to, to do that. And it's kind of like, so it sounds like for a lot of people, this is the senior bowl is almost like a, uh, a football version of Comic Con, right? I mean, it's just kind of like these guys go yeah. and they, they they check everything out, and you know, this is this is what they do, especially the draft guys. That's that's what they do. So that's really cool. I'm glad you were able to go down there, and I'm I'm super grateful you were able to join us. Appreciate it. And um, if you go again next year, we'd love to talk to you about it. I don't know For if sure. you have plans to, but <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it was it was it sounds like a really interesting experience, and. Um, you know, hopefully I can make it down there sometime. That'd be, that'd be kind of neat. We'll see. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. He's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. And uh, as we mentioned at the top of the show, you can get this program on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. You can also get it now on Megaphone. We're on YouTube. And as always, Cincy Jungle carries all of our content. So get the program how you've been getting it. And uh, we're going to keep giving you more content, hopefully, <laughs> different content as we go forward in the new year because it's a new year for the Bengals. So we got to get you new, uh, new content and everything as well. John, I think before we get to some listener questions, I think we should talk a little bit about sights and sounds from media week, the early part of media week at the Super Bowl. Let's, um, we are not, I am not cool enough to be on radio row or anything like that. Um, maybe at some point we'll, we'll get, we'll get our butts down there. That'd be, that'd be fun. Maybe do it for a day or two. We'll see. Um, but there were some interesting sound bites that came out from a couple of uh, high profile people that are, well, we'll start with AJ green, AJ green. Um, he, was asked, I believe it was by, uh, was it Joe Daneman, um, of, of Fox 19 out in Cincinnati? Uh, he basically, he t was talking to AJ Green, and um, I think aside from hearing that you know, his rehab of his toe that he had surgery on is going well, I, I mean, he's never going to be like, oh, this is horrible. Not, nobody <laughs> ever says that. It, it, it always goes well, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I, I'm, you know, he's, he's a pretty athletic guy, so I'm, I'm sure it's fine. But uh, something definitely to keep an eye on. Regardless, about the coaching change, um, A.J. Green gushed about Marvin Lewis and saying, you know, saying he's a great guy and, uh, you know, he, he was, he's was he been there since I've been there, all that kind of stuff. But he said, a new head coach is the spark that we needed. I, I think it's an obvious statement. I think it's a little eye opening from you, a guy that's usually pretty low profile, um, doesn't really say a lot of things that rock the boat. But I think back, and this is, I want your take on this, John. I think back to 26, uh, 2017, 2017, I believe it was, maybe it was 2016, but it was the game against the Jaguars when AJ Green exploded on Jalen Ramsey. 
uh, they got in the fist fight. And that was something where, number one, you, you, you had to think, number one, Ramsey had to just be saying some pretty terrible things to him for a guy like AJ Green to do that. But number two, you ha- I always thought, man, the losing is building up on this guy. Um, and that thought kind of came to mind when I saw this quote about, you know what, he was just, he, maybe he's been holding this in and he has been feeling, along with some other players, that it has been time to move on from Marvin Lewis and they needed that change probably sooner than now. Yeah, but there's also, I think, the the whole component of if A.J. Green is saying this and he's kind of saying it for the rest of the team because, you know, naturally, you know, veterans and rookies behind will always follow Green because he's like <clears> – <throat> He's like the de facto leader because he is the best player. He's like the leader on the offense and kind of what he says will, you know, kind of determine where the direction is going to go. And I think if he's the one saying this, and I think there's a clear distinction that the whole team is kind of with that message. So I think he's kind of taking it upon himself to kind of say that this is the direction of, you know, type of PR that we're going to go into because Marvin's gone or something. Not really much we can do about that. And I do think that players would, have welcomed Marvin back because Marvin's obviously well loved in that locker room. And I think he still, I think he still is because he's always been that player's coach. But I think Green realizes that this is the reality, so we're we're, we're going to take this head on the best way that we can to kind of get the most positive press, whether he believes it or not. Because you know, I, I could buy both ways that he would be open for a new head coach or just try to try again with Marvin. But I think him saying this is a clear positive, and he's trying to kind of do this for the rest of the team so that they don't have mm-hmm. to. Do- I, I guess, and I think he's kind of asserting himself as that leader, like in in year eight, that he that he already clearly was. But I think this is something that he needed to say, and I do think that you know, in in a way, he does believe it because you know, e- e- even someone who's perceived to be a, a, as loyal as Green is to Cincinnati, at, at some point, he's got to have those you know motivations to do something more than just get to the playoffs and lose in the first round. He has probably much bigger desires than that. He wants to win a Super Bowl. And I guess that he did realize that, you know, some change needed to happen. But I I do think that he was trying to set a clear message that everybody that he wanted people to follow. And I think that message was just this is the this is the change we needed and, you know, be as positive about as as possible. Yeah, I mean he wasn't slamming Lewis or anything like that. But it's but it's one of those things where you go, oh, okay. Uh, it's just it's it's an interesting comment um, from a guy that's pretty like I said pretty low profile. Um, the one you know one of the things there were a handful of things Marvin did well, but one of the things that he intentionally did that I thought was a good move was when they drafted guys. They usually drafted guys from big that were talented players from big programs and programs that won. And uh, Green is no exception. You saw Joe Mixon at the end of this right. last year kind of talk about how, you know, he's not used to losing all this kind of stuff. And I think, I think that's a good thing to have in this locker room. These guys that are, they get upset when they lose, they're not paycheck players and they're not used to losing and they're not used to losing on the big stages because they played on a lot of big stages in college and won bowl games, all that kind of stuff. So maybe that's part of where, this comes from from green because he went to Georgia, a pretty successful program, right? Yeah. And like the past three years, the past three draft classes, like uh, William Jackson was drafted. Houston was like at the, at the, at the peak of its program's career because they just beat Florida state. I think they drafted. Um, yeah. You, like you said, Joe Mixon, who Oklahoma was like the beginning of, or not the beginning, but they were, they were always the top team, in the big 12. They're always used to winning. Billy Price was drafted, obviously Ohio state. He experienced like 50 wins there, I guess in his career. And when, when these young guys started coming in, and the Bengals won 13, 19 games in the past three years. You're like, you know, what, like, like, what are we doing here? And, and that was like the beginning, I guess, at the end of Lewis's career because he didn't make the playoffs at that point. And, and there was there was just a certain boiling point, I guess, and there's a certain you know, time where, like, we had this influx of talent that is used to winning and we're trying to establish a winning culture. But, you know, the, obviously the culture that we have now is n- nothing to do with that. And if this, is, if this is the group that we want to build behind, then we got to get some type of new direction to get them back to, you know, where they're playing best and utilize them better and j- try to get them back in into the mode that they that they were, you know, entering the NFL. And I, and you know, like one day I guess Billy Price is going to be one of those leaders, and Joe Mixon is already kind of establishing himself as a leader. And they have, you know, a lot of other young guys on defense who kind of fit that same pr- kind of profile. So j- just in the past couple of years, I think it was really like where that's that started to expand and, and started to kind of creep into the the other noise coming in that was kind of countering the full blown support of, of Lewis just because it was the end of like Lewis's time here and when he obviously didn't experience much much success. 
Yeah, the other interesting um, the the other interesting comments uh, were from Zach Taylor. The and obviously he couldn't comment about um, his status with the Bengals and you know say I am the coach or anything like that. But uh, he talked about his time in Cincinnati. Talk, you know, being a coach at, the, at UC, and he talked about. Um, you know, what's prepped him, even though he hasn't been a head coach, what's kind of prepped him to potentially become a head coach. Um, I, I don't know. Any any thoughts on what he was saying? And, and to me, it, at least in the little brief snippet I heard, uh, he, he came off as pretty impressive in terms of uh, how he presented himself. But obviously that's, you know, a minute soundbite. <laughs> you can take from that what you will. But uh, your thoughts on, on what Taylor had to say uh, during uh, – uh, I guess on Radio Row this week. Yeah, I think it was kind of what we expected. We, we, we expected someone who can kind of, you know, in in the same way, I guess, when Marvin first started here, he kind of had a way with words and kind of had a way of persuading his message and kind of coming coming across as a guy who belongs in this position and is worthy of a position like this. Mm-hmm. And like, I, I remember, like, j- j- just in, like in this past day, I read something about how Sean McVay kind of built or climbed up to where he is now because he had long past connections with the Gruden family that ended up getting the job with Jay Gruden in Washington. And then when like the, the Rams needed a new coach, I think he had some other connection there. Taylor kind of had that same kind of upbringing where um, he was, he's Mike Sherman's um, uh, son-in-law. Sherman was the head coach of Texas A&M. That's where he got his grad assistant. Then when he moved to the NFL, Sherman was a coach at Miami and he, and he became the quarterback's coach there. And then from there, he kind of just, you know, established himself but it was from those past connections but at the same time these guys are obviously extremely qualified to be where they are today and if taylor was so impressive that the Bengals were had their eyes on him you know weeks before the season then when they had the intentions of moving on you had to think that you know th- this was more than a guy that was just i guess buddy buddy and a close uh, a close assistant of sean McVay, where he had more than a, that connection he has clear qualifications of kind of running his own show and i think He's the kind of personality and has the temperament and has the the right qualifications to turn a team as in a stale rut that the Bengals are into some something worth relevance. Yeah, uh, I hard to disagree with anything there. I, I I'm just I think we all are eager for the time when we hear more regular sound bites from him and he mm-hmm. is officially the Bengals head coach and he can talk about the staff members and we can evaluate all of that. Um, and that should be probably next week. Um, by the by, the time by next podcast episode, we should be talking about some of this stuff, which will be interesting. But um, I think we're all waiting on pins and needles. It's been basically a month um, that we've been sitting here saying either who's the coach, when is it going to be officially announced, who's going to be the rest of the staff, all that kind of stuff. So, um, it's but not I, be I, the enemy. It's not going to be him. It is not going to be him. I think it would be announced that it would be him at this point. Um, you are correct. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I, think that he's – he showed why supposedly he really impressed the Bengals staff in terms of – front office staff in terms of uh, getting the job. And um, I think I think – He'll, he'll bring a presence. And um, one of the things I'll be asking Tyler Boyd uh, this week is, you know, talking about the fact that immediately the coach they're bringing in is either going to be a Super Bowl winner or a Super Bowl. Uh, he went to a Super Bowl. Um, so he has Super Bowl experience right the previous year before and how that's going to, you know, what kind of sway that's going to have in the locker room. I'm interested to hear what he has to say about that. But um, anyway, some interesting uh, sound bites and news from uh, Media Week uh, leading up to the Super Bowl from AJ Green and Zach Taylor, who is the presumed head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals, taking over from Marvin Lewis. We're pretty um, pretty interested in seeing what else he has in store for this team going forward. This is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast. He's John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. You can get this show on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play. We're also now on Megaphone. Uh, we are, as always, on YouTube, and all of our content is on cincyjungle.com. So get us how you s- like the best, I guess. So you had a you had an interesting viewer question, uh, I, I believe, right? That you want to bring up? I did. Um, are are you ready for this one, 
John, because this one's this one, because I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't like that foreshadowing. It's, it's <laughs> bad now. The reason the reason I ask is because if it's the one that I think we're going to talk about, it's because you were the one who received a lot of hell uh, about the Ryan Tannehill thing um, and the topic of Ryan Tannehill, which, by the way. I think you wrote about this as well on CincyJungle.com. This has not gone away because uh, Mr. Mr. Twitter polarizing guy, Benjamin Albright, talked more about the fact that because there's news that came out that Alex Smith may not be able to play in 2019. That was already kind of conjectured anyways. But um, that it's as more time is passing, it's looking less likely that he is going to play in 2019. Then you connect the dots of Jay Gruden, who is now – interviewing Ken, uh, Ken Zampezi as his quarterback's coach in Washington. You know, might there be a trade for Andy Dalton to Washington? And then they interviewed Tampa. Bill Lazor today, too. Okay, there you go. All right. So, for the same position? Yeah. All right. right. All right, well, you see the connections there. This one comes from Jason Dickerson, who actually, I didn't realize, he lives in Germany. Um, I, he's He's been in contact with me a lot. Uh, mostly via email, and I didn't realize he was living in Germany. So uh, that's pretty cool. Another, another little side note we'll talk more about in a second. Anyway, um, so he brought up the idea of Derek Carr to the Bengals. And you sit here and you go, well, how does that make any sense? Well, you have to connect some dots here, okay? The first is uh, we talked about Daniel Jones earlier in the show about his performance at the Senior Bowl. John Gruden, big quarterback guy, supposedly really likes Daniel Jones as a prospect and as a, as a uh, potential NFL quarterback. If you remember, before the season, uh, there was kind of some, some rumblings. Uh, I, I, I'll have to pull up exactly what they were. But basically, John Gruden, I think as the Monday night commentator or something to that effect, was critical of Derek Carr. And there was some thought of, well, is Derek Carr even really a fit with – John Gruden, might there be some some issues? And uh, Carr had a decent statistical season this year, but obviously was not uh, – that team was stripped of talent before the season even began in terms of trades and whatnot. Then you look at Brian Callahan, quarterback's coach, which my colleague uh, John Sheeran here broke the news that uh, from the Senior Bowl that Callahan will be the Bengals' offensive coordinator once Zach Taylor arrives. Raiders quarterback coach becoming the offensive coordinator – People potentially wavering on Dalton in terms of a new staff, new head coach. So there's a lot of dots to connect here. Does it make sense to you, John? I'm going to piss some people off, but it doesn't make as much sense as Tannehill because I actually just looked at Derek Carter's contract now, and he that's that's the biggie. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so it it makes more sense for the Raiders to cut Carr than for the Dolphins to cut Tannehill because I think the Raiders would only incur like half of the dead money that the Dolphins would have to to actually release him. I think they're, I think the Dolphins are trying to work out a, for a trade for Tannehill. And if they can't do that, they'll probably just cut him because I think they owe him like 26 million. But yeah. for the Raiders, I think they only incur seven and a half million in dead m- money if they release him now. And they're drafting fourth overall. So they'll definitely be able to pick Daniel Jones. Um, but I think if it comes, I think if both Tannehill and and Carr become available on the open market, which I think one of them at, at least will. I I honestly think that Taylor is going to kind of win out that vote and bring in his guy that he worked with at Miami over the guy that Callahan worked with for a year in Oakland. But for for the purpose of what I believe either of them would come in and be, would just be that bridge quarterback for one or two years while they work on getting the guy for the future. I don't think it would make that much of a difference, but I I, I don't think is as likely as it w- would be with Tannehill, I'm, I'm honestly because I'm just not entirely sure what Carr's future is in Oakland because he does have like they do like this is the this is the first year that they can finally move on from him, and if they are smitten with a quarterback, then there's no reason to keep, to, to you know keep on to that contract because they liquidated all the other big contracts that they had over the past you know six months or whatever. But I think there's a little bit more there's a little bit there's a little bit more writing on the wall with Tannehill, and I think Taylor being the head coach and Maybe even the play caller for the, for the Bengals is kind of kind of went out in, in his preference for Tannehill over Callahan's potential influence in bringing in Carr. I guess. 
do you think, because this was one of the questions that was brought up when you talked about the Tannehill thing, do you think that Carr, who, again, I think we're two years removed from a season where he was a borderline MVP guy. Uh, I mean, he had an outstanding season. I think it was in 2015 or 2016. 2016. Uh, yeah. yeah, 2016. That, that earned him this contract. Uh, this year, threw for over 4,000 yards, 19 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Not, not great there. But uh, 2016, 28 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, almost 4,000 yards that year. Um, uh, I, I don't. I mean, do you see it? Do you see those numbers greatly increasing? Because you know, their two best players, aside from Carr, were released off the roster. Khalil Mack doesn't play offense, but uh, Amari Cooper. You saw the impact he had in Dallas. Um, do you think that a guy like Carr would, if he's playing with AJ Green, Tyler Boyd, John Ross, Joe Mixon? Do you think that all of a sudden? That is a career resurgence, and you're closer to the 30-touchdown, single-digit interception guy in Cincinnati with that talent, or do you think that year was just a a fluke of a year and we're seeing a little bit more who the real Derek Carr is these past couple of seasons? 2016 was Derek Carr's – 2016 for Derek Carr was Andy Dalton's 2015. It was when everything around him clicked perfectly. He was in the perfect system. He had – probably the best offensive line of any of any team besides the Dallas Cowboys for in terms of pass protection. Mari Cooper popped off that year. Just everything was clicking for the Raiders. It was like their first good season in, in a while. And it literally ended like Andy Dalton season where he got injured and couldn't play in the playoff game and couldn't do anything for that. And ever since then, just like for Dalton, it's been more on the downhill slope. I just think that Carr, Tannehill, and Dalton are all kind of in that same tier of quarterbacks where everything needs to go perfectly and they need that perfect team for them to do anything. But even if they get into the position of getting into the playoffs and winning, we haven't seen them actually proven that they can do that, I guess. And, and, and until we do see anything from those three, they should all probably be belonged in that same category. And we can't really expect them to elevate a team and carry a team if, you know, everything around them goes, goes to crap because once the Raiders, you know, receiving core, you know, diminished and once their offense line got banged up or they had to start cold Miller, we saw him struggle. And I think he was like the most check downy quarterback in the NFL, where he's like, yeah. depth of target was like six or seven yards or something stupid like that. And I think he's got a better arm than what, Th- those numbers were but if a quarterback has the tendency to just kind of kind of check it down and not look downfield that's not going to do your offense any good if you have guys like aj green and john ross that can spread the, that can you know stretch the field like that so i think Carr has established himself as the quarterback that the Bengals should be looking to move on from but again if you're looking for just a bridge guy to kind of keep your offense afloat then you know there's nothing really wrong with him especially if you get him for cheaper than what he is but I don't think that we're going to see him be any better than what he was in 2016 unless he consistently has a perfect offense around him, which which is what Bengals fans continue to want for Andy Dalton. Right. Um, and, and, again, it comes down to cost and, you know, is Derek Carr substantially better than Andy Dalton? Is he a guy that's substantially better? It will be more expensive, uh, more substantially better than guys that are in this year's class. Um is he, like you mentioned, John, no more than a bridge quarterback? And if he is, is that is he better than Andy Dalton and gives him a better chance to win more games than, than Dalton in that capacity? These are all questions that are a little bit of a, a unknowns at this point. I think one is inclined to think that the ceiling might be a little higher for, for Carr um, based on that one season a couple of years ago and the fact that that team has kind of been fleeced of talent that he's been on and the Bengals do have kind of a, you know, uh, a, a tr- trio of talented guys at skill positions on offense and all of that. So, uh, but we'll see. I, 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 you know, it sounds like a far-fetched thing. We're talking about all this, all these kind of crazy quarterback scenarios, but it sounds like tinfoil hat stuff, but really, I mean, there are connections to be made here. You know, the Gruden to Daniel Jones, he just worked with him in Mobile. Uh, Brian Callahan to Derek Carr, he just worked with him in Oakland for a year. Uh, you know, who knows how this coaching staff views Andy Dalton. I mean, there's a lot of things in play here. So I don't think it's – it is it is a little bit of a far-fetched question, but I don't think it's a wacky one or a crazy one to really ask, to be quite honest with you. It, it's just one that is a new one 
Um, there are connections yeah. there and there are, are dots to be connected there. But interesting, interesting question. Thanks for that, Jason. We also got another email from, we had Jason from Germany and we had Glenn from Denmark. Um, Glenn Ellisborg Jorgensen, Jorgensen. I don't know how exactly how they say it. Jorgensen. But, uh, right. Yeah, I think it's the Y, Jorgensen, <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he said, uh, first of all, I just want to tell you, you're doing a great job with the podcast. I've been a regular listener for more than a year, but unfortunately I can't join in live as it's the middle of the night here. Well, thanks, Glenn. We'll give you a pass on, on that. We understand. Um, basically, he says, and this, this one, uh, I'm going to leave to you, John, because you probably, I have some, some notes on this player, but uh, you know, you, you're, you said you were excited to kind of talk about this as a Dane. I'm very excited about the draft prospect. And I am, is it Jalte, Jalte Fro, Froholt? Yeah. Is that right? yeah. Guard, from, guard from Arkansas. Um, do you think there are any chances he's going to end up with the Bengals? Um, I will say this from my notes and, and I'll, I'll let you talk pretty extensively about him, John. Um, he's kind of a, he was a four-star guy in college, um, going into college. It sounds like he's very athletic and he's got some nice skill sets. Uh, he's sounds like he's strong, but it doesn't always translate to the field type of thing, if that makes sense. Um, and he, it sounds like he's made some big improvements in terms of from like when he started playing football for Arkansas in about 2016 to now. Um, he, it still seems as if he might be a round five or later type of guy based on some stuff that I'm, I've been reading, but uh, I'd like to hear your take on him, John. Yeah. So even me, that the guy who does a lot of offensive line stuff, I have a guy that kind of tells me about, offensive line prospects his name's ryan you can follow him on twitter at royal red legs um he probably, <laughs> won't, he probably won't like me plugging his name because he's a movie guy that doesn't always talk about alignment but he's a guy that um ryan introduced me to, to uh, uh, jolty i think is his first name and he played with um frank ragnow the center from arkansas who was linked to the Bengals a lot and he played next to him last year and then he also for hold actually did play a pinch of center this year and he said, just pop his tape on. You'll see like three or four pancakes in the first two minutes. It doesn't matter what game you're watching. I'm like, all right, dude. And legit, I watched the first two and a half minutes against like Colorado State when he was at center. And he pancaked like four guys in the first quarter. And it's like the, the torque, the lower body drive, the pop that he that he has and either reach blocks or down blocks, it's extremely evident. And some guys you can tell, you know, like some guys may bench 40 times at the combine. Some guys, you know, can, can swat a lot, but... This guy has actual play strength, and so mm. play, play strength that that does translate to the field. And I, I I think he's athletic enough to make those angle blocks, but when he's got his hands on you, like it's it's over. And he told me he told me what his name. Tr oh yeah, here we go. His sword his, or something, right? Yeah, it, it, it literally means hero, it, like hero oh, sword okay. or stuff like that. So like obviously a first round name. <laughs> if you know, if you know my name only you draft him in the first round, but. He's got extremely good tape, and I think he, and I think you're right. It, it it did get better over time as long like the more he kind of learned and got kind of got integrated with with the system. He played against SEC competition. Obviously, Ragnall was a good player coming out of Arkansas, and he kind of has those similar traits. And he played a lot of guard, like I said, a little bit of center. But I think he's a I think he's a good prospect. And and like you said, if, if you can find him in that fourth or fifth round, I think he's a definite body that you bring into camp and maybe even potentially compete for that right guard spot because I think he's got a future in this league as 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 a spot starter, at, just as a rotational backup that gives you a lot of, of, of scheme versatility but has those qualities that you just simply cannot develop in you know, a guy who has all the measurables and the talent. But if you don't have that that core strength, that, that torque to be able to drive up off blocks, you're just not going to be successful in the long term. And I think he has that right now at 22, 23 years old playing against SEC guys and – you know, uh, I, m m maybe Bengals fans are too scarred from drafting Marcus Hunt to draft Eastern European guys or or Scandinavian guys, but um, he, he's a player, and I think they should definitely take a look at him. Yeah, and he's got more experience than Marcus yeah, Hunt. Yeah. Uh, he's in, also in, not twenty seven. So yeah, yeah, Marcus Hunt had the one year, and uh, I mean, great production, but the one year wonder type. And ironically, Marcus Hunt has gone on to have a, a couple of nice years with the Colts since moving on from the Bengals. Go figure that one out. But. Um, 
I, I like what you said, and, and one of the things, now granted this was during the Paul Alexander, Marvin Lewis era, but one of the things the Bengals have coveted out of their offensive linemen is versatility um, and, the, and the ability of guys to be able to play, especially the interior guys, to be able to play guard, to be able to play center, um, you know, especially those backup guys. You look at TJ Johnson, you look at Trey Hopkins, you look at, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, you know, they even tried to experiment Andre Smith at guard and tackle. There, there's, there's a lot of guys that they like to have positional flexibility there for to, you know, potentially save roster spots. And, and like you said, kind of be able to have a spot starter if you're in a pinch to be able to come in and, and play well. I, you know, I, I getting this question, I've kind of wanted to now research this guy a little bit more. I, I looked up some reports on him and, and saw a little bit about him. But uh, I, I think he's a guy, like you said, could immediately be a guy who's a, a backup guy for a team, you know, make the team be a backup guy, probably a day three pick um, and, and can, can help out a team in that capacity early and then maybe push for a starting job as he gets um, more time under his belt. Now, in terms of Glenn's question for him going to the Bengals, I mean, obviously, there's there's 32 teams. You can go 32 places. It, it just depends. But um, the fact that the Bengals seemingly have a, an open right guard position right now, also, uh, you know, right tackle, even though this, this kid doesn't play tackle, but that that should be open um, as well. Clint Bowling is now entering his uh, ninth year, I believe. So, um, you know, that's something to think about as well. There, there's a lot of... of issues still to be resolved on this offensive line. So um, if there is a spot that any team that needs able offensive linemen, interior offensive linemen, the Bengals are one. So that, uh, you know, that could be a possibility for him, but uh, good question. And we're, we're, we're worldwide, John uh, guys are, guys are emailing us from, from Germany and Denmark. It's pretty cool. Uh, we'll get out of here with this last one. And this was through text um, and, uh, now we're staying in the States for this one. And it's from good friend, Frank from Virginia. And he jokes, uh, three weeks in a row. Does that count me as a regular? We usually have our regulars, uh, Terrell and, and John from Kentucky and a few others that call in. Um, so Frank in Virginia, I guess, I guess three weeks in a row, if we do answer your question, that, that does make you a regular. So thanks for the text in advance, Frank. Um, We know Callahan is in, and most outlets seem to have high confidence in Del Rio. Um, high conf- I, I'm assuming that means high confidence in Del Rio being the defensive coordinator. He seems to be yeah. the guy there. Uh, yeah. who, who do you think are likely candidates to fill other vacant position coach openings? That's kind of a difficult question because we have to kind of – look out there. I think, you know, you mentioned the Mike Sherman connection. He's been kind of one that's, that's floated out there. Um, Brian Callahan's dad, Bill, you know, there's been some, some rumors of that. Maybe, you know, those two guys are linked to the offensive line group. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think they were smart to keep Livingston as the, as the secondary coach. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think he did a good job with the safeties there. Um, But I, I think they need to be pretty, I think they need to be pretty careful with who they bring in at these other assistant marks because now you have an unproven head coach, basically an unproven offensive coordinator. Del Rio is, uh, I think, a good hire in the fact that he's got a lot of experience in the NFL, um, so that's a good guy to lean on. But uh, any other ideas or names out there you want to toss toss around uh, that you think could be good fits for the Bengals in some of their position coach capacities? You've got tight ends, you've got offensive line, you've got quarterbacks. Um, what am I missing here? Uh, linebackers, um, you know, things like that. Yeah, I'm not tremendously prepared for this question, I guess, because right. you know, it's, it's like you, you don't you don't hear about these guys until they get hired, right? Like unless they're like former, you know, coordinators that that got fired that are, are just looking to get a job, I guess. Um, I, I know some people have doubts about Bill Callahan coming, but I think. From from how early that was like being reported or whatever, I think the the Bengals do have plans to either swindle him away from the Redskins or because because when excuse me the, the Buccaneers hired Bruce Arians, the Tampa Bay ended up sending a six round pick to Arizona because they thought that Arians was still under contract with Arizona and they didn't even have to do it. 
I think that's a possibility that the Bengals could do with Washington, either to, to establish good faith and potentially a future Andy Dalton trade, or just to get, you know, Zach Taylor's former college coach in, into the staff and, and replace Frank Pollock, obviously, because I don't, we don't know if Pollock um, either left on his own accord because he didn't like the direction that they were going, or they just had, you know, future ambitions for a guy who's even better than Pollock. And that definitely fits the bill for the bill for Callahan. But I'm definitely interested in seeing who the linebackers coach is going to be, because you're looking at not only just a new defensive coordinator, but uh, under a new head coach who was obviously defensive oriented and was a former linebacker coach of his own. You know, it, it could be a guy who was, who worked under a uh, uh, Del Rio or just, you know, a, a guy, another system from another team who's just looking for a fresh start. But whoever that linebackers coach is, I, I think that's the position in general that we will probably see the most vast difference because of how low the quality has been at that position group for so long. And just, just the same kind of coaching philosophies under Lewis. So to have a fresh face there, and I know I'm kind of dodging the question because I don't have a name for it because honestly, I just don't. But I, I just think that's really just it, it'll, it'll just be the probably the most interesting one to watch because we we should probably expect some fresh brand new philosophies and brand new preferences of of players at that position yeah i mean there are some some uh interesting names still out there um one that kind of and, and this would be something maybe for the quarterback's coach thing um and it might elicit some eye rolls i'm not a big fan of the guy myself based on kind of some of the things that he's done but he I, to my knowledge he is available uh and that's joe philbin um and he's he's kind of an offensive mind a guy that i i, I don't know again you look at some of these position coaches he's been a head coach was fired as a head coach he was an interim coach this year um, you know, so he could be a guy that if you're looking for bigger names that could be floating out there, um, you know, there are other assistants kind of working their way up as well. Um, but do not be surprised if it's a bigger name, quote unquote, that end up filling some of these position coach uh, things. I mean, we saw, um, the, the Bengals linebacker coach, uh, his name is escaping me at the moment. Um, he was the head coach of the Saints. Uh, they just got rid of him, but uh, he had head coaching experience. Um, and uh, yeah, what the hell? I, I can't even know. <laughs> Hazlitt, Hazlitt, gosh, uh, it's been a long Jim Hazlitt. It's been a long week already, but um, wait, wait, he was our, our former linebacker coach, yeah, yeah, Jim okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Jim Hazlitt, he, but he was a guy that was a head coach for a long time, a defensive coordinator, right. and kind of took the the perceived step back, if you will, in terms of going from NFL head coach to a position coach. Um, so that's why, if you're looking for bigger names like a Philbin to be a, you know, he's a guy, an offensive coordinator type of guy, head coach, interim head coach, and then he could potentially do a quarterback coach type of thing. Um, but they already have. Um, they already have Alex Van Pelt as a quarterback's coach. So maybe he comes in as like an offensive assistant. I don't know. Um, it, it just depends. But, uh, you know, there are big names out there that are still looking for jobs. Guys who – there are guys that make lateral moves because they feel they've been passed over in a specific uh, team within a specific team. So we'll see. It's hard to really kind of pull up a name and say, oh, you know, this guy could be the assistant coach aside from some of the names we've already heard kicked around. But I would say do not be surprised if there are some big names that potentially get linked to a position coach position, uh, staff position, as well as do not be surprised if you're, if you're, there's kind of some guys where you go, who? Uh, you know, some guys that are a little unproven. We'll see. Uh, thanks for all the questions tonight, guys. Uh, we appreciate it. Sorry we didn't take calls and stuff. We already had a few queued up, but uh, we're running a little long on time, So, we, but we wanted to get to those. Um, you can get this show on iTunes. You can get it on Stitcher, on Google Play, on Megaphone. You can get it on YouTube and on CincyJungle.com. And as always, we appreciate the support. We appreciate all the questions. And for everybody tuning in live, a lot of interactions tonight. Sorry we couldn't get to all the comments, questions, and all that good stuff. Um, final thoughts. Uh, John, you have another quick story from uh, the Senior Bowl that you omitted 
when yeah. we were talking about it earlier. Um, what, what, what's that all about? Yeah, so I, I I had this in my notes and for some reason I didn't do it. So if you want to edit this and put it where, where it probably should belong, you can go ahead and do that. But the last day of practice, and like, like, like we talked about, there wasn't a lot of Bengals coaches down there. And but there was the uh, the offensive uh, line assistant coach Robert Couch that was down there watching offensive linemen, and I'm like, all right, this this would be a perfect opportunity to kind of maybe introduce myself or kind of get his thoughts on the offensive line group. So I went over to try to talk to him because there's an empty space on both sides, and he and right as I was about to introduce myself, there was another guy. He was like a longtime friend of his that just came up right in, right up there and talking like, damn, I missed my chance, whatever. But like I I stuck around to see what happened and. Turns out he just talked to him for like 20 minutes about the same exact stuff that I was going to ask him. And I basically had my notebook out, kind of like turned away a little bit. And I just kept writing down literally everything that he was saying. It was like taking like notes from a college professor. And I had like like one and a half or two pages worth of notes of just complete offensive line notes about his preference of scheme, players, what he kind of likes. So I may not be that great of a reporter, but when you're talking about spy work, I, I would probably do well in that for court, like court <laughs> Good to know. And you're wearing, like I said, you're wearing the right jacket for it. You look very uh, <laughs> secret agent esque uh, in that in that jacket. I like it. I'm jealous. I uh, I wish I was I wish I was styling in something like that, like you. But uh, I'm I'm uh, fashion. I don't know. Fashion not inclined. Fashion fashion declined. I guess. Uh, unlike you, my friend. But it's a bargain deal, uh, by the way. Only only <laughs> Uh, well, I appreciate that's that's a cool story, and I appreciate you sharing all that stuff. Um, you know, uh, it's it's an experience to go do that kind of stuff, and um, I'm glad you're able to do that. I'm glad you're able to to report back to us and to the to Cincy Jungle website about all that stuff. It's pretty cool that you were able to to do all of that. I'm jealous. Um, and at some point, I'd like for us to, you know, either we make a we make it a point to go down there together or something like that. Um, or we, uh, you know, we go on site somewhere in Cincinnati. I'd like to 20, do something. 2019, cool. we got to get a live show, a live, a live show, like uh, with us together. That's yeah. I, I, I would like to, you know what I would like to do? Uh, and this, now we're just like round tabling, like we do uh, before and after the show when we, but whatever, we'll do it on the air. It's cool. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I'd like to do is just, um, whether it's for the draft or something, make that, you know, maybe one of the live shows, whether that's in Cincinnati or um, I think some of the, the live drafts are coming up in uh, there. When's the next one? L no, not LA. Uh, it's in Nashville, I think this year. Yeah, that's right. Nashville. Yeah. So there's probably going to be one in LA when they open that new stadium at some point, there's probably going to be one in Vegas. That would be just oh. insane. Yeah, I don't know if we'd make OBI, it out alive. OBI takes Vegas, baby. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if we'd make it out alive that if we did did that out there, but uh, that'd be fun. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'd like to do something like that. Maybe even if it's in, you know, if if we go out to Cincinnati and do an on site thing or something, I'd like to do that at some point. So we'll see. Um, but we're gonna get out of here. We appreciate all the uh, all the interaction and and everything. Um, I don't really have final thoughts except for the fact that I'm a little. I, the Rams keep me interested in this Super Bowl. Otherwise, I'd probably be relatively disinterested. Uh, do you have a prediction on who's going to win the game, John? Patriots by two scores. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think the Rams are going to match up as well as they think they sh they will be. I think the Patriots are going to have answers to what what they do on defense, and they're going to make Jared Goff make big throws that he just can't do. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Wow. Uh, I. I I don't know. I think that uh, championship weekend showed us that, that, that the games can be pretty close and, and could be pretty close. We'll that see. True, because Patriots Super Bowls are always close. So yeah, they usually are. They usually are. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, Oh God, I really don't want New England. To win again. Um, I, uh, I'll say Zach Taylor brings a ring in and they, they win by a field goal. How about that? I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll be, I'll be optimistic. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, but enjoy the Super Bowl this weekend, however you may be watching it. Um, in, enjoy yourself, and uh, let's let's hope that uh, let's hope that Zach my my wish comes true and Zach Taylor brings up. Let's get that too. ring, Whit. Let's get that <laughs> ring. That's right. Uh, this is the Orange and Black Insider Bengals podcast for John Sheeran. I'm Anthony Cazenza. We'll see you next week, and hopefully, we'll be talking about um, the Zach Taylor hire being official. So check that out and also check out our upcoming interview once again with Tyler Boyd. So uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.